good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's library lecture. Our guest speaker is Shannon Gilruth, Wake Forest Fellow and Professor for the Interdisciplinary Study of Law, as well as Professor in the University's Women and Gender Studies Department. A graduate of Wake Forest School of Law, Professor Gilruth is nationally recognized as a leading young scholar on issues of equality, sexual minorities, and constitutional interpretation. His 2006 book, Sexual Politics, The Gay Person in America Today, was nominated for two prestigious awards, the ALA Stonewall Prize for Nonfiction and the Lambda Literary Foundation Award. In 2007, his case book, Sexual Identity in excuse me, Sexual Identity Law in Context, Cases and Materials, was published. It's designed to put the law concerning lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people into a social context. In the School of Law, he teaches courses in sexuality and the law, religion and the law, and gender studies, and serves as an associate professor in Wake Forest Divinity School. He actively speaks for gay rights causes, frequently consults on cases, and has been cited numerous times in journals and in the popular press. For today's lecture, Professor Gilbert will discuss the principal points of the legal and political philosophy he sketches for the gay liberation movement in the 21st century in his forthcoming book, Gay Lives, Straight Laws, an unapologetic appraisal of life under the law. And now I'll turn it over to Professor Gilbert. <clears throat> My uh, favorite part of that introduction was being called a young scholar. <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, Carolyn and, and Dean Sutton and the other folks who organized these uh, lectures for inviting me over to talk about my um, new book, forthcoming book, really, uh, Gay Life, Straight Laws. And I want to thank all of you for showing up. I was certain, as I walked over here from the law school, realizing that my shoes aren't exactly waterproof, uh, that this would be a pretty much empty room given all the snow, but uh, it's nice that you all came out. Um, talking about, you know, a, a book in a library seems uh, a very fitting thing to do, but my colleague Ron Wright, I'm not sure if Ron made it over here, he said he may be coming, he can attest to the fact that this morning I was sitting in my office fretting about how I was going to talk about an 11 chapter book in roughly 25 minutes. Uh, and so what I decided to do was not to talk about 11 chapters in 25 minutes and to focus instead on, on, on one thing, and I'll get to that in a minute. But the book itself is 11 chapters, and it ranges over um, an array of topics, including some very technical, legal uh, argument about the distinction between privacy and equality theories as a basis for grounding um, rights. Uh, also, how we might appropriately regulate hate speech, uh, or as I call it in this book, anti-identity speech, uh, and why we should, in fact, so regulate that speech. Um, also, of course, the marriage controversy. It seems one can't talk about gay rights without talking about marriage. Um, but also pornography, transsexualism, so a, a wide range of issues. That's a lot to, to have packed into a short talk and still leave time for questions and answers. So, uh, as always, I find my students enlightening, and so I polled them. And I said, if I could talk about one thing from this book, uh, today, what would you suggest? And marriage won hands down. I suppose that should be no surprise. Um, so I'm going to talk about that in, in a moment. Uh, I'll just sketch the basic argument I make, which is not the argument you probably expect. Mine is a gay liberation argument against marriage. Why gay people should in fact resist marriage as opposed to clamor for it, rush headlong into it. Um, and then I want to leave ample time for intervention, for questions, discussion. I've provided, um, courtesy of my secretary, a short outline of the book. Uh, at least I think it's the most, <laughs> the last outline, um, which should give you the title of the chapters and some of the, the most basic points that are being made in each one. So 
in our question and answer time, I, I'm happy to answer, discuss anything that that outline prompts or just anything that might pop into your head as it relates to gay rights. Um, not necessarily about what I'm going to say in the next few minutes. Um, but before I get to marriage, let me say a few words about the overarching purpose of this book, Gay Lives, Straight Laws, the subtitle of which um, this book is, by the way, forthcoming with Cambridge University Press. So it isn't out yet, so I still have the luxury of tinkering with it. And the subtitle, um, as it was just read to you, has in fact changed um, to that as it is reflected on the outline. And as this talk was advertised, the meta-ethics of gay liberation. Um, the book is about an I a radical idea, uh, equality. And I say that's a radical idea because although it is constantly the topic of polite, liberal, academic discourse, um, many marginalized people, specifically in the context of my work, gay people, live whole lives without it. And this is a book of legal theory, specifically about how legal theory operates in and through the lives of gay people. In some works, uh, most works, Theory is a clever way of eliding reality. And as this book, I think, shows, judicial and academic theorizing over the years about equality has resulted in the perpetuation of second class, maybe third class, citizenship for gay people. Um, theory created in the image of straight dominance, which almost all theory about equality now is, simply has not fit the reality of gay people's lives, or the lives of women or most minorities for that matter. And recognition of that, uh, combined with encounters of the past several years with various colleagues and students and clients even, has uh, persuaded me that a new theory uh, was needed. So the, the resultant work which is encompassed in this book, I think, is a theory um, rooted in gay life. And it is a theory engaged with reality, uh, which most theory is not, uh, contending with reality, in some cases calling for its large-scale revision or change. And its method, that is the method of my theory, is not merely the application of reality uh, or of gay lives to existing legal possibilities. The method of this book is the engagement of law with life. And that's a method often touted but seldom practiced with a few feminist, uh, notable feminist exceptions in typical academic analysis. So its aim is a new order in which homosexuality is something other than simply the complement of heterosexuality or a counterfactual to straight supremacy. Its aim is to envision a world in which gay people are finally and irreducibly human in a meaningful sense and in doing so it departs significantly from the status quo and calls to question a number of dogmatic suppositions that currently un underlie the so-called gay rights movement. Uh, among those, um, the domestication of gay rights through an increasingly narrow focus on marriage, more on that in a moment, the focus on biologic causation for same sexuality, the centrality of trans sex issues to the emergent gay rights agenda, and the defense of pornography is somehow uniquely liberating and formative for gay identity. So in sum, the purpose is to root a meta-ethics of gay liberation in gay lives and experiences where it belongs. Now one of my students asked me yesterday, what exactly do I mean by meta-ethics? And I guess that's a fair question. So as commonly understood, meta-ethics is the study of meaning of the meaning and nature of ethical terms, judgments, and arguments. Now my book is very much that, uh, in that in the process of making new arguments, it analyzes the terms, judgments, and arguments uh, that already exist and notes that they are overwhelmingly deficient. But by choosing this particular subtitle, I meant to indicate more than that. And of course, the ethics part doesn't give anybody any pause, right? We're all familiar with what <coughs> ethics is, a set of uh, principles of right conduct. But the prefix meta means higher, beyond, more comprehensive. So I chose it to reflect the fact that some of the arguments I make in the course of sketching this philosophy of gay liberation are not um, exactly legal ethical arguments. Uh, for example, my arguments with regard to marriage and pornography, and pornography in particular, 
uh, when I talk about gay pornography, I'm not making the <coughs> usual arguments about the First Amendment and whether pornography should be protected in the First <coughs> Amendment. I'm instead arguing that the pervasiveness of gay pornography actually prohibits gay people from exercising their First Amendment rights in all other settings, uh, in, in maybe all other rights in all other settings. So those aren't strictly um, <coughs> legal ethical arguments. Um, yes, <coughs> by choosing meta, I also mean to suggest that an ethics in, rooted in gay experiences would be higher, beyond, <coughs> superior to, anything heterosexuality has produced. Um, largely because it would be an ethics infused with the empathy gleaned from lifetimes of living in and under oppression, buried alive in oppression uh, in reality. So um, I also meant it, it in that context. Meta also indicates, of course, tra change and transformation, and what I hope to accomplish here is a discursive change that is both substantive uh, in theory and reality. So this book is really an action, and it, it is its own context, because no context existed that could include it, uh, which I think is probably why it has been, uh, at least the ideas that are in it, have been, in the words of the flyer that advertised this thing, controversial. Um, so the book asks and deals with big questions. But if we were to distill all of those questions in their various contexts into one essence, I think it would be this. Who can a person be after a lifetime of being made into no one? No thing, nothing. And the answer to that question is made all the more difficult because the hierarchy the term I use to describe the straight hierarchy in this book, has always posed the questions, defined the parameters, and in most cases has hidden the answers. Any gay person who manages to stay alive is engaged in a struggle for the freedom of self that this particular inquiry entails. But in the process of this struggle for self, gay people face a beguiling every day which is, it's like uh, Scylla and Charybdis of Greek mythology. It looks like placid open water until you're suddenly drowning in it, drowning in the everyday. It is um, a vortex, really, that the gay movement has sort of plunged into unwittingly or maybe rushed headlong into without really much thought of uh, as to the danger. And the vortex is the heterarchy's very cleverly constructed every day, uh, in which they succeed in defining even the gay struggle for identity on straight terms. So we get this sort of myopic focus on uh, the monogamous family ideal, uh, reproduction, marriage, of course. Uh, so much to the extent that when I teach my courses on sexuality, uh, I always begin the semester by asking students, why did you want to take this course? And almost invariably, sometimes 100% of the students will answer, well, because I'm really interested in the controversy over gay marriage. <laughs> as though gay rights as a universe were somehow coterminous with this question of marriage, which really affects very few people. Uh, and all of this, of course, makes sustained attacks. This is why it's clever. It makes sustained attacks on the political system of straight supremacy uh, unlikely, if not altogether unthinkable. Because if the goal has become assimilating into the straight model, then who would think of destroying it? And if revolution's too much to hope for, who would even think of engaging it analytically if it uh, is unable to be seen for the simple reason that it is omnipresent? But valuing these things on straight terms requires gay people to forget what the heterarchy and its everyday has meant for them. And that is their conceptual and too often physical <coughs> liquidation. So Gay Live Straight Laws asks that gay people stop self-censoring and start making the obvious connections between the <coughs> heterarchy's power, the institutions used to perpetuate it, 
and Gay's own possibilities for freedom. So in addition to the big questions then, I ask for some big commitments. Because making these necessary connections will require that one sees not only one's own life, um, and of course individual rights, if you listen to the liberals and the conservatives, uh, they converge on this. Individual rights seems to be all that matters anymore. But what I ask for is an understanding of the interconnectedness to the lives of gay people in other places, in other circumstances, existing in other degrees, other stages of straight-induced torture. Equality rights, and this is the central premise of this book, are after all group-based rights. So I'm talking about a process of consciousness raising that takes gay from object to subject. And I think it's only when we begin to approach the questions and, and uh, are able to read the context from this vantage point that we will truly be able to see what is an entire pattern of deception for what it is. Now, this mission, uh, as I've just sort of briefly sketched it, has, uh, as I noted, been controversial, right? But why exactly? Uh, why is the idea of discovering something that is authentically gay and using it so threatening? Well, as to the legal arguments I make, I think there are a few reasons, and principally among them is that lawyers don't like change. Um, an almost immediate investment in the system surfaces in recitations of its imperviousness to change when I start talking about changing it. Uh, lawyers, especially liberal lawyers, uh, the kind that you find in the academy, um, offer me this defense, this reason that what I propose, which is namely rethinking substantially and substantively our constitutional commitment to equality, moving it from um, discussions of sameness, that is, can we be uh, sufficiently like the people with power to warrant protection, to understandings of caste, um, all of this, they tell me, simply can't be done. Um, for them, the law as possibility is coterminous with the law as precedent. Um, I suppose it's understandable uh, that the abstract level at which most academics engage the law um, makes the practicality with which I engage it look abstract. And so I guess it's also understandable, if not particularly admirable, um, that people who draw their value from telling other people what the law is based on where it has been would be resistant to um, throwing out what they know because what they know doesn't work. Uh, nobody wants to admit that, I suppose. Uh, but if, if nothing else this project has taught me in, in speaking about in various places and writing about the theories that um, collect in this book, I will never again mistake liberalism for the possibility of change. Somebody asked me as I was walking into the library today if I identified myself as a liberal. Everybody else certainly does. Like I'm, you know, I'm the raving liberal right on campus. But I don't identify myself as a liberal. I am a radical. Uh, and proud of that um, moniker. And, and there are important differences. Radicals want to get, I mean, the etymology of that word is to get to the root of the problem rather than to placate it. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to be um, defined as and thought of as a radical. Um, what I think about this, these legal disagreements is that if gay people are asked only to rely on the things as they are to better their situation, then they are essentially being asked to rely on nothing much. And I also think that the law, even the law, sometimes changes. So why shouldn't this be one of those times? Aren't gay people worth it to try and change it? Um, but I think there's something more to the resistance to some of my ideas than simply the glacial pace with, uh, at which the law changes. And to illustrate that, I want to, and, and this is an overall comment on the methodology of my theory. And I want to illustrate it by sharing with you a few snippets from reviewers. Every, every writer's friend, the reviewer. Uh, here's a quote. Gilreath writes with great force and passion. So far, so good, right? 
but, and his arguments will offend almost everyone I know of who writes for gay rights. Uh, another reviewer, Hillary's frustration, resentment, and anguish resulting from the mistreatment of gays are palpable in his rhetoric. The anger and hurt may cause discomfort for readers. Well, we wouldn't want that, would we? <laughs> now, what I want you to notice here is that the reviewers are focusing on me. Not so much what I've said, but on me, the vehicle through which it is said. And as fascinating as I am, uh, I think there's a deeper reason for that than what it might appear on the surface. Most academic literature, as, as, as you've all encountered, shuns the first person. Uh, they is substituted for I in most circumstances. Moreover, most problems are analyzed in terms of hypotheticals, and lawyers and courts love hypotheticals. Hypothetical people and their hypothetical problems, uh, which usually amount to hypothetical wrong answers. But the gay people that I know uh, are real people with real injuries, and I think that they uh, need law and, and a gay rights movement, which is important, that understands them as real people with real injuries. So, in the presentation of these things, I don't feign neutrality. And I don't treat the heterarchy and its injuries as if they are abstractions. And I don't pretend gratitude when the straight hierarchy is simply less cruel than it otherwise could be. That marks me for suspicion. Basically, the comment is, how dare I assert myself existentially into a debate that affects me existentially, and what's more, claim my own terms in the process. I think the really telling one, uh, recently anyway, has been this one. A post to an influential Catholic uh, legal theory blog in which a professor writes to say that the recent article I, I wrote um, arguing against religious conscience exceptions to emerging marriage equality laws, the very sort of religious conscience exceptions that have been enacted in every marriage equality law that has passed legislatively. Um, I wrote arguing against these things. Um, and the poster, the blogger, says basically that my arguments should be wholly discounted because I have a, a horse in the race to get the quote exactly right. This despite the fact that I am constantly saying marriage is not an appropriate end goal for gay liberation. And would it interest you to know that the person writing this, the person accusing me of having too much of a vested interest in the debate, is not only a professor, but a Jesuit priest. <laughs> now, I ask myself in reading this comment, how interesting and why uh, would he comment on my supposed investment in the debate without realizing his own investment in the system of sexual fascism that he theorizes to maintain? And I think the answer uh, is that from the perspective of the heterarchy, my assertion of self, my first person, my I that is all over these pages, makes me untrustworthy. His eye, on the other hand, is totally invisible, even to him. The why of that is important, and I think it's because his eye, that straight assertion of self that sweeps up whole populations, is unquestionable. My eye, as a gay man, uh, who's supposed to be invisible, makes me immediately suspect, subversive, somehow dishonest, his eye as a straight man, on the other hand, makes him authoritative, comfortably, academically neutral. And so, a theme that threads its way through all of this is that gay people are denied the I am as an epistemological assertion of self that is taken for granted by straight society. Law and public institutions are designed to safeguard the straight conception of self, to enrich it, to scaffold it. But no such institutional framework exists comparably to support gay selfhood. So consequently, gay people have been assigned an identity by the heterarchy, and that has historically been the identity of criminal, subverter, distorter, and so on. And so a part of the method of this book is to explore the evolution, and that's really chapter one in the outline, uh, of that identity by looking at key legal developments that have given shape to it. 
Um, and also to note that because gay people have been denied the I am, they have been denied the you in the jacuz sense. Um, and by this I mean they've been denied the ability to advocate effectively against social, political, and economic oppressions. Because if you don't have an identity, from what ground can one challenge oppression? And so in this context, what, what is in actuality oppression sometimes feels and looks like freedom, or at least it's claimed as such, uh, to give the victim an identity stake in a power structure from which they are otherwise excluded. And I think the common manifestation of this phenomenon, anybody in the room who is gay will know what I'm talking about, the phenomenon of acting straight, right, as a way out. Uh, to, so to be masculine or a straight acting gay man uh, or a feminine lesbian is a way of siding with the abusers and claiming straight male dominance. So the method of this book has been to discern a more authentic eye for gay people, to take back the self, uh, and that act of be speaking uh, is what I think is so suspect to the heterarchy and its reviewers. And that observation takes us to marriage. Gay live straight laws taken as a whole would enunciate a theory of equality that would make, it, if practiced, uh, marriage equality a reality. But it does not proceed from the valuation of marriage as a normative good. Rather, it subjects marriage to an inequality critique as an institution through which subordination operates. It warns that obsessive focus on marriage, that is the label, uh, as opposed to equal rights, uh, for example, property or familial rights, may be a distraction. No, may is too soft there. Is a distraction from a more important civil and human rights uh, issues that are facing gay people. And it argues that as a principled matter of gay liberation, gay people should reject marriage and all of its heteronormative conventions. Marriage has been the chief vehicle for heterosexual male domination through history and should, I think, for that reason alone be resisted. Uh, but I suggest a particularized theory of the relationship between sexism and heterosexism with marriage as sort of a magic mirror of exposure. We see one in the other. And what I think is that gay people have missed an opportunity by focusing on marriage. They had an unprecedented, we had an unprecedented opportunity to create a new institution. Call it civil union, <coughs> call it whatever you want. But an institution that would be equal legally to that of marriage, but without its negative patriarchal, social, and legal baggage. By rejecting marriage, gay people had the potential to destroy the hegemony of straight supremacy in matters of coupling and the potential to bring equalitarian-minded straight people along to a new model. After all, what is most threatening um, from the conservative side about gay marriage is the idea that sex might finally be taking place between gender equals. That is what is so threatening. But I think... Um, We've opted for something different, and we've opted for a sort of continued domestication of the gay rights agenda, uh, which has proven really an instrumentality of continued heteronormative subversion of gay identity. And I, I don't, you know, my job is not to pronounce on the decisions of my brothers and sisters. It's merely to sort of point to an emergency and an understandable one. Uh, because I don't think it's surprising that gay people have sort of become obsessed with the idealized family, because most of us have been, or are, uh, being hurt in exactly this space where there's supposed to be love and acceptance. So reforming the family becomes a way to undo or to unlive these negative experiences based on sexual orientation. But at all times, of course, minority groups in struggles for civil rights have to consider the costs. And I think a tremendous amount of energy has been expended in an attempt to reform heterarchical institutions, with the result being that very little real liberation uh, has come from some very big and some very costly efforts. Meanwhile, 
uh, you know, while we have a few people focused on marriage and what it can do for them as individuals, or perhaps two by two, um, gay people at all stages of life remain disproportionately hunted, assaulted, murdered, homeless, addicted, prostituted, pornographed. What does something like marriage mean to a population like that? And one of the costs of all of this domestication has uh, been a loss of radical edge. A radical revolutionary stance, one that critiques patriarchy and militarism is less often heard in gay rights discourse. Instead, we have aggressive calls for assimilation into the very institutions that define those evils, marriage and the military. Um, and the gay masses, for lack of a better word, see the liberal leadership of the gay movement and realizing that these are the only people they know, the only gay people they know, uh, who are not being denied employment or a status simply because they are gay identified, believe that the leadership must be on the right track. What they fail to see is that this same leadership has co-opted the movement for their own ends, focusing on only those goals, usually marriage, that are central to their comfortable and total middle class assimilation. And I've often wondered what would happen if marriage suddenly opened up nationally. Would our leadership just retire? I mean, what else would there be for them to accomplish from their perspective? I think until gay people begin to critique the politics of representation that values only that which is paradigmatically straight, um, liberal opportunism will be the most we can hope for. Uh, and it's liberal opportunism always in the guise of individual rights progress. So we need to seriously embrace a shift from reformism to radicalism. Uh, and inherent in this critique is understanding the endemic self-hate that fuels and drives assimilationism. Um, the grief and despair gay people live from simply being gay people is reified in a politics that pushes marriage as a means to quote, civilize gay people, as Bill Eskridge has put it. And so that which might be authentically gay is not just obfuscated by such proposals, but the ability to discern its authenticity, authenticity uh, might be entirely short-circuited. Marriage has been billed as a settling down when it's really just a settling for illusory comforts of the straight paradigm. And it is the hallmark of a movement that has become too comfortable and has begun to see progress only in liberals' terms. But as James Baldwin, one of my heroes, once put it, you can't integrate into a burning house. What I want for gay people is the freedom to build our own house and a stake in writing the building codes and in carrying out the inspections. And really, why not? Why shouldn't we have all these things? We want to make laws, not just live under them. And that's what I ask for and theorize to make happen in Gay Lives Straight Laws. Equality in law and life. And equality means that we are equally entitled to the whole world. And I think that we will have it. I want to thank you for coming out in the snow uh, to hear this little talk. And I really want uh, and am very much interested in your observations, your questions, things that some of my remarks may have prompted for you. Questions? Yes. I have two. I'll say so you can choose to answer whichever one. Okay. Can you either start by defining, you use the phrase authentically gay. Uh -huh. What do you mean by that? Well, how would I know? <laughs> I've never been able to live in a world in which discerning that is possible. So, what I asked for in this book is a, a, a peeling back the layers, that an understanding of the everyday that straight people have created as a clever mechanism to keep us from moving to a point where we, where we might discover what is authentically gay. So I don't know the answer to that question. What I'm concerned about is the ability to get to a place 
where we can answer that question. Um, a, a moving from the background to the foreground um, with our sense of self intact. Yeah. I'm interested in your ideas about hate speech regulation. Oh. Uh, well, let's see. In a nutshell, uh, what I say is that certain types of speech uh, that I define as anti-identity speech. So it is speech aimed at the existence of um, traditionally historically disenfranchised, marginalized people. And so, you know, paradigmatically we would think of African Americans, women, um, uh, Jews, gays uh, as examples. That sort of speech, speech that is aimed at dehumanizing gay people, and essentially not opening up political discourse, but actually is used as a sort of terrorism to silence voices from these groups, should and could consistently be regulated um, with the First Amendment's commitment to free speech by understanding that the 14th Amendment's equality norm creates the compelling interest necessary to reasonably regulate those forms of speech. Um, usually when we think about free speech, uh, and of course in this country, we, um, although the Supreme Court's relevant precedent on this has never actually been overruled, we, we believe that free speech is almost absolute. And so anytime that we talk about speech that is not only expression, but is at the same time, a practice. Uh, and anti-identity speech is that. It's the practice of subordinating other people through expression. Uh, what we say in this country is free speech, hands off. What I suggest is that we have this other equally important value, equality. At least when we talk about these questions, we ought to, we ought to weigh each in the balance rather than acting as though they just exist in parallel universes. Um, but that is, that is a radical idea, and it's, it's a very controversial one. Um, because, um, again, in this country, unlike m most Western countries, we have approached free speech as an absolute. And, and my point in all of this is that no right is absolute. All of our rights are defeasible. Um, the important thing is to discern what is a, an adequate basis for defeasibility. And I think the equality, the equal humanity of, of certain targeted groups, because of their his, history of being targeted, um, their interest in equality outweighs the interest in the speaker's right to speak. Yes? Along those same lines, do you think that, um, in, that the First Amendment can also be used to defend um, the prohibition of hate speech or punishment for hate speech because it's, as you're talking about it, kind of being used as a discourse ender, as a, like a silencer. So do you think that it works also? Does that make sense? So it's not just that you know equality and speech are both part equated, right. but also that this hate speech is being used kind of to silence another person's right. To yeah, well, an anti-identity speech, um, and then of I would include as a a category of anti-identity speech, pornography, um, does in fact prohibit its targets from exercising their right to free speech. But I also see this as a system in which, you know, the, the other the, the other response, ju judicial response, has been, well, if we're going to stop one viewpoint, then we have to stop the other viewpoint. We have to shut everybody up, right? My theory says, not really. Because in a system of government that is supposedly not constitutionally neutral on the subject of equality, why can't we recognize the difference between pro-equality speech and anti-equality speech? And so I think, consistent with the Constitution, we could regulate anti-equality speech and still have a robust system of pro-equality speech. Pat? Hi, Shan. You're not alone in your radical politics. That's right, I know. I always have a fellow radical in you. Yes. Um, in Chapter 7, Shannon, it looks like you're equate or coupling pornography and death hmm. together. Okay, so, and I think I can understand why, but could you expound a little bit on why 
you um, are putting these together as though they're related to each other? Am I reading that right or not? No, you're, you're right. I'm, I'm saying that there is, basically in the chapter, I say that there is a choice gay people can make. They can keep their pornography or they can die. And, and I think that that is not an overstatement for a few reasons. One is that gay pornography um, is special, I think, because at least with straight pornography, most women understand the, the ill effects pornography works on women as a class. But with gay people, the response has been quite different. Gay people believe, they really believe, that pornography is somehow formative. It is necessary for them to understand how to be gay people. Uh, I gave a lecture um, at a, another university on this topic once, and, and uh, a young man, college student, raised his hand in the audience. He said, but Professor, how would I know how to have gay sex if there were no pornography? I mean, one, I think you'd figure it out, and two, I think it's a little, you know, it's a little like learning how to drive by watching a monster truck rally, you know, I mean, it, it, it sets up unrealistic expectations. But more importantly, what it does is it legitimizes the reduction of gay people only to sex. And this has been the primary way by which the heterarchy has kept gay people in chains. Because when you walk down, as a gay person, when you walk down the street, um, let me back up. As a gay person who identifies as gay and is identified as gay, when straight people encounter you, they see sex. You are reduced only to that. Pornography mass mediates that. Uh, and it is bought, it is made internecine, it is internalized by gay people themselves. So the idea is that gay people are sex. The acme of sexual liberty is to be possessed, to be had by a straight man. I'm, of course, speaking in terms of gay male porn here. Um, and so the internalization of this worldview by gay people themselves has made it impossible for gay people to see themselves as anything else but sex. Um, as, and as anything that, you know, other than deserving subordination in some way. So, so that's one piece of this. The other piece is that I think that there is a real correlation between the resurfacing in really alarming numbers of unprotected or so-called bareback pornography films and the rise in HIV infection among young gay men. Uh, if you look at the statistics, and, and the, the pornography industry is very helpful on this. They keep their own statistics, and they publish them all in a very nice, glossy magazine called the Adult Video News. Um, the law school librarian loved when I uh, asked to have a copy of that <laughs> subscription to that purchase for the library. Um, they publish all this. And the fastest growing segment of gay pornography is unprotected sex pornography. And I think that there is a direct correlation between that and, and HIV infection among gay men. So I think in many ways, pornography for gay people equals death. And as a matter of gay liberation, it ought to be resisted. Again, I'm not making an argument here about how we deal with it legally. I think the best, you know, you and I taught this, I think the best argument uh, about how to deal with it legally is to treat it as a civil rights violation. And, and uh, Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin, the late Andrea Dworkin, um, proposed what I think is a very workable law to deal with that problem. It was excoriated by liberals and conservatives alike. Uh, liberals didn't like it because it treaded on the sacrosanct free speech, and also, I suspect, because most liberal men lawyers want their pornography. Uh, and conservatives didn't like it. Um, because it showed women as deserving of some modicum of respect. Uh, so it was declared unconstitutional as a violation of the First Amendment. But I still think uh, it would be the most workable approach. And, and in fact, versions of it have been adopted and have proven workable in other countries. So just to follow up, so the, the death aspect, not just physical death from HIV or any other um, uh, sex carrying disease would be a death to the psyche you're saying um, yeah or a multifaceted human being and just you know creating the person as a um, 
a, a mono human being in the sand. That I, I think that's a, a nice way of conceptualizing it. I think maybe I, I was even at a prior point here. I, I was saying that anybody who can be conceptually liquidated, and that's what pornography does to gay people uh, and to women, anybody who can be conceptually liquidated can very easily be physically liquidated. I mean, it's a very short slide from conceptual liquidation to physical liquidation. It is why anti-identity speech as a category is so dangerous. Because if you can dehumanize, I mean, think about what the Nazis did to the Jews. If you can dehumanize totally through speech and expression a target group, then you basically have carte blanche to exterminate them. So, um, so the way you put it is, is very erudite. I think maybe I was even prior, at a prior point to that. Other questions? So, should we wrap it up? <laughs> one more question. This, this will do it. Okay. And I have to see how to phrase this because I've just been trying to think about it. Um, okay. This is not a theoretical one. This is a practical one. So it's based on maybe your own experience in life and having to deal with this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, what it is is try, try, trying to deal with people who may not think that they're homophobic, but the word that I prefer to use is really homo-hating, because mm -hmm. I think what, that's what it really is. It's not really a fear of gays and lesbians. It's a hatred of. Okay, So people who don't really understand and may think that they're not homo-hating but exhibit and say things that are very, very oppress oppressive and, and hateful and hurtful. So it's kind of like breaking through. You can't. It's hard to break through that barrier because there's no admitting that they are homophobic. Right. And so, but you want to somehow or other progress or educate. And I'm just wondering in your own life if you have any ideas on how you can break. It's almost like it's harder to break through that kind of a barrier than it is somebody who says, yeah, I hate gays and lesbians, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, personally, I just don't let people, I don't give people a free pass. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I hear them say something like that, I say, seriously? Really? Did you just say that? You know, I mean, uh, I think uh, if, if any of you have followed this John Mayer business, uh, you know, his interview in, well, Playboy of all places, right? <laughs> um, where he, you know, makes some very um, racist remarks. He calls his, uh, his penis a uh, white supremacist and uh, says, you know, various other things. And the media jumps on John Mayer as a racist. He, he also, by the way, uses the N-word uh, in, in this interview, somewhat unabashedly, uh, as, as though, you know, he's perfectly entitled to. And the media jumps on him and says, oh, John Mayer, this is terrible, what have you done? But nobody bothered to register that a few paragraphs later he drops the word fag like he had just said Sunday. Nobody bothers to register because gay people are the last group against whom it is permissible to openly discriminate and then call that discrimination comedy, viewpoint, religion, uh, so I think it's important that we call people on these things uh, and we just say, you know, what you just said there was, in, you know, terribly heterosexist. It was terribly um, in, inappropriate and out of line and I don't like it. And that's what I usually do. It makes for some awkward situations. <laughs> but as I said, there are big commitments to be had in this and I think that's a rather small commitment. Thank you all so much for coming out.